CBA01. So, yeah. Two in a row, which are British not built aircraft carriers for the key ships. Why? Because, honestly, I felt that they could build upon each other. And one of the narratives which I feel sometimes we forget, especially when you consider the US Navy is the benchmark Navy of the modern world, and there is a video on this channel about being a benchmark, a benchmark Navy and the criteria that come with it, is that we often therefore treat whatever they do as being the right way. And it's the right way for them. Doesn't necessarily always make it the right way for others. The US Navy has certain peculiarities which play to their strengths but will not play to others. One of the best examples of this is the crewing of their ships, the sheer amount of crew they carry. When you compare them to equivalent vessels and equivalent roles in other navies. Another you can certainly go for is the sheer amount of infrastructure and scale they have, which does affect the cost of what they're procuring. It's one of the interesting things when people tell me in turn I go, Oh, your ships are more expensive. Well for let's say the British ships. Although once I was accused of being Danish and the Danish ships were more expensive and I was sort of going, Well for starters I'm not Danish, but I'll still defend them because the Stanflex system makes sense, but you know, you're misrepresenting it. The reason, you know, it, it, things are cheaper when you build more of them. That has a factor to do with uh, to do with the cost of them. If you consider when you're building the thousands upon thousands of cars which are built by Ford or by Skoda or Toyota versus the number of cars built by Rolls-Royce or Bentley. the sheer scale is a factor in their costs. They might spend a similar amount in terms of research and development over a type of car, but that cost is going to be spread across many, many more units by Ford, by Toyota, by Skoda, than it is going to be across Rolls-Royce or Bentley. It just is. CVA01 comes about because the Royal Navy has a carrier group, a carrier force which needs to be replaced. They have HMS Victorious, they have HMS Ark Royal, they have HMS Hermes and HMS Eagle. They have four carriers in service. And one of the... Let's be honest, they're all interesting vessels. Eagle and Ark Royal were audacious class. Hermes was a central class sort of light fleet carrier which had been adapted. And Victorious was, well, an illustrious class fleet carrier which has been really, really expensively rebuilt after World War II. And we can get into the whole scenario of whether it would have been better to just go to Malta route than what they did, but they this is the route they've gone. And originally the Royal Navy was planning on replacing all four. And the indications they are given by the government when they start looking at them in 1960 is that they will replace all four. The government in 1960 is quite happy to replace all four to build CVA-01, 02, 3 and 4. So it's going to be a four ship class. The idea was to build two batches of two to replace Victorious and Ark Royal first, then Hermes and Eagle. Eventually, they reduced this number down to three, then two, and then, of course, the 1966 Defence White Paper cancelled it completely, along with the Type 82 Destroyers, although one of them was already in service, and various 
other projects were cancelled. There is often a discussion as to their names, what they would have been called. Uh, Queen Elizabeth and Duke of Edinburgh is a favourite one to go around. People go, Duke of Edinburgh. I would love a ship to be named Duke of Edinburgh, but it's that to me comes from the same area as the people who are naming the uh, N3 battleships the Saint class. It doesn't fit. Duke of Edinburgh's don't get that capital ship's name for them. It's not that level. Prince of Wales, and if you consider the current Queen Elizabeth class are Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, that's a po quite a strong possibility. Ark Royal would probably be one of them. It could have been Queen Elizabeth and Ark Royal, considering the fact that in the Invincible class there is an Ark Royal that uh, that is added in even though that spoils the whole eye-naming scenario, I would say Queen Elizabeth and Ark Royal definitely... Prince of Wales... and... Eagle and Hermes are both quite traditional names for the Royal Navy, but uh, in terms of aircraft carriers. But... there is also Illustrious... There is, which turns up again in the Invincible class. That So that could well have been the fourth option. Or, you know, there are areas for them to go, but I doubt it would have been Duke of Edinburgh. And it's interesting to consider the Type 82s really are the closest spiritual, con uh, spiritual successors in the Missile Age to these ships. In fact, very nearly came very close to adding in HMS Bristol and Type 82 class into this book. I said against it because it's making a big leap. And these are the three ships which all stem from Henderson's designs and Henderson's work on, and well, Henderson and Goodall's work, on building a large fleet general purpose destroyer, which was a gun destroyer. So it made sense as a, a contiguous book. But the thing is... The Royal Navy was trying to build... Four... At full load... 64,000 ton carriers. Now, if we consider those are a bit bigger than the Malta class would have been, but not possibly that much bigger than the Malta class, and they are roughly the same, roughly the same as the modern Queen Elizabeth class. So not small ships, but there again, they're also not really Kitty Hawk sized vessels like the Americans were building at the time, which are oh, 80,000 tons. So Britain was concentrating on trying to get an efficient availability. And why do you need four carriers? Why do they want four aircraft carriers? Well, it's the same reason as you have four ballistic missile submarines, to guarantee one at sea at all times and another one available. So you can guarantee one at sea. And if the one at sea has problems, the available one can go out. And you've got one going in refit, and you can keep up a sustainable approach to them. Air groups are more sustainable when you've got four ships. Uh, crews are more sustainable when you've got four ships. You are at a level of critical mass that things start to work out. Free ships, you can fudge it, especially with some staff or uh, some land appointments for the personnel. Four ships, you can easily sustain it. Or rather, it's at the required critical mass, especially once you're dealing with ships of this size. Six ships, it's viable. But it's straightforward, in a way, to maintain the skill sets, etc. And then it's eight 
is really, really good in terms of numbers. And then multiples up there, and once you're above there, it just gets easier and easier and better and better. But honestly, you're looking at, for most escorts, you're looking at multiples of eight or higher. And for capital ships, you're looking at four or higher to really have a sensible force generation in terms of the unit available and in terms of the crew. They were going to be free shafted designs, the CVA ones. Again, why? Because the Royal Navy is trying to save money and displacement as much as they can. They want to build these ships, but they know the nation is on a budget. But they're also being told by the government they still want to project power around the world. So one of the interesting things is you're looking at it post sewers. The British still have this second largest carrier fleet in the world. They are the next most powerful navy in the world without any question after the USN. And they have the status of it. Britain still has a significant presence in the world and a significant capability. You could argue we still have a significant presence and capability in the world today. But in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, it was far more apparent. Now there are issues at home. Please note. Britain not only has issues of inter-service rivalries, the Royal Air Force are going for a very weird phase, but so is everyone at this point. Because the governments are... The governments in the 1960s understand there's a problem in Britain in the economy. They understand that the governments of the 1950s have coasted and made some poor decisions. But in the 1960s, they honestly don't have a clue as to how to fix those decisions. They're good at image, they're good at gloss, they're not good at actually fixing them. And so they are instead concentrating on what you would consider short-term measures. Let's cut this, cut that. What's the best image for Britain? Having a modern aircraft carrier to go around the world or having a modern bomber? And by the way, we end up cutting both. Please note, this is how bad the government is. The government makes a strategic decision to decide that they want to go with... The, Air, the Royal Air Force has made the correct presentation. This is, <clears throat> again, kind of like a certain decision made in the about USS America. We have made a decision based on the strategic reach of aircraft. They'll be able to provide... The Royal Air Force will provide the long-range air defense for fleet operations and the global strike capabilities. We don't need the carriers. Okay, you've made that. We're going to invest in these aircraft to do that. They then don't buy those aircraft. And they end up using to try and fill the hole in the RAF the very aircraft they've taken off the decommissioned carriers. This is one of the problems which historians have when we start pointing and talking about the British in terms of their global reach and capabilities in the 1920s and 30s and in the period of empire. Some recent governments have made such atrocious decisions and such nonsensical decisions that it's sometimes very hard for people who have seen those or lived through those or un have a good understanding of those to understand that there was a time when British governments made, well, I wouldn't like to quite characterize them as sensible or intuitive decisions, but actually something verging on approaching sensible and almost logical. It happened. It was a whole period. It was beautiful. I don't think it'll ever happen again, but we can hope. We can live in hope. Perhaps if we study history, we can be better informed by it and we can better do these things. Now, you can say this is very much a British-style carrier. Yes, it's got deck edge lifts. 
it has some various things in terms of its shaping, but it is orientated around generation of constant operation. I see. How do I put this again? If we go back to the carriers in the 1930s, when Britain and America and Japan are all under the cost of treaties, all limiting them, you can either build your flight deck and your operation around a constant flow of operations, constant drumbeat, or you can build it around an alpha strike, i.e. where you can marshal the aircraft and launch a big strike. You can't, you can get sort of an 80%, 20% solution of 80% oriented one way, 20% the other way, so it can do it a little bit, but not as efficiently as the other one. But you can't really get it so that it can do both really well. If we consider the Kitty Hawks, they're the Americans once again doing both because they've got something which is 80,000 tons, it's able to do both. With enough aircraft, etc., it can do both. The British are looking at it going, well, we don't want to spend a lot in upgrading massive infrastructure. We don't want to, because we're not going to get that much money out of the government. We don't want to spend a lot in upgrading yards, because we're not going to get the money out of the government. We want to build the most versatile carrier we can for how we operate. We want it to be the most modern we can for how we operate. But we're going to orientate it around. Uh, but we're going to think about what we need to do. First things first. There's only two catapults, not four. Originally they were looking at four. They worked out four you need if you want to do an alpha strike of some kind. Two will do for the continuous operations. They started off with three lifts. They found they could do two with continuous operation uh, if they're doing continuous uh, if they're doing continuous operations rather than trying to mass in quickly for an alpha strike, you cut the cat the lifts down by one. It means you're going to be less rapidly able to move aircraft all your aircraft up to the deck to mass them to launch a big uh, to, uh, to launch an alpha strike. It takes up less weight, also takes up less space, but it also has less cost. So these things all are factor in. And I've put in a lot of for reference here to the modern Queen Elizabeth class because I thought it was quite good to actually go through and think about it. The design specifications, displacement, as I said, 63,000, 64, uh, 63,000 long tons, 64,000 tons at full load. Length, roughly 282 meters. Modern nature Queen Elizabeth class, 284 meters. So two meters longer for the modern ships. Um, beam 56 meters, modern Queen Elizabeth class 73 meters, draft 10 meters, modern Queen Elizabeth class draft 11 meters. So we're not talking about massively or wildly different ships in terms of their size and scope. I would actually like, and I'm fairly open admitting this, I would like the Queen Elizabeth class to be longer. My major reason for wanting to be longer is I'd like them to be longer than the Kuznetsov class. So about an extra, you know, 30 meters. As the Kuznetsov is a length of 305 meters overall, so if you add it on roughly 30 meters, you'd be up to, I don't know, 314 meters. It would also allow you to expand things like the hangar and those things, but it's purely me from a personal perspective and me liking the idea of our carrier being bigger. National pride coming. But it doesn't need to be. And if, again, if we go back to it fits with the design of the CVA-01. It fits in. Power. Six Admiralty uh, boilers supplied three Parsons steam turbines providing roughly 135,000 horsepower uh, to three shafts for a top speed of 30 knots. Now, a range of roughly 7,000 nautical miles at 18 knots. Please note, because that's off, 8,500 nautical miles at 18 knots. There are some sources which list sort of slightly different figures, but yeah, 18 knots. 
the multi class were 7,100 nautical miles at 20 knots. So it's going to be within that region. And I am not going to estimate what the cruising speed of the current Queen Elizabeth class is. But seeing as there are listed cruising speeds for pretty much all her escorts and all the supply ships that are in her task group, making her cruising speed dramatically different from that would probably be a little bit stupid because she wouldn't be able to use it. Or rather, at least that's going to be one of her cruising, spe cru uh, cruising speed settings. Yes, I know. It's it. I'm not going to start talking figures because people will quote me, and there aren't listed figures. But it's also not the most difficult thing in the world to look uh, to work out once you look at the task group and what her oilers and her supply ships are going to be going at. But these things are secret, officially. Compliment. 3,215, including air group. The modern HMS Queen Elizabeth has berths for up to 1,600. So she's got half the people aboard her that the CVA-1 would have had. I haven't put Queen Elizabeth's um, <clears throat> air defense situation on board her because, frankly, she's just got close in weapon systems. She depends on her fighters for her outer air defense. And she depends on her escorts for her area air defense and point defense, with her own mis her own radar systems, ACM ACM systems, and of course the close and weapon systems providing the closer protections. But CVA one was going to carry Sea Dart. One wonders how long that would have survived, or if, rather like with the Invincible class, it would have been dropped off as a way to carry extra aircraft once they realised they could. For Sea Cats, hmm. it's going to be decent, decently armed, but again, that's the difference from the Kitty Hawks. They did carry Sea Sparrow, or other equivalents. Sorry, someone just appeared at the window. Um, and of course, they also they had phalanx close and weapon systems, but they were carrying up to ninety aircraft, and they were designed around the operation of those aircraft. It's the same with the CVO one; the aircraft come first, not the missile system. So again, this is going to affect their utility. Has some armor, unspecified for side and underwater protection, but had something. Aircraft carried. This was up to 50. HMS Queen Elizabeth, modern one, carries roughly 40. And please note I'm saying roughly 40, because you can work things around to be carrying slightly more, you can work things around to carry slightly less, but you have the aircraft size of the period. You have 18 Phantoms and 18 Buccaneers, which is 36 strike aircraft and air defense fighters, which is roughly the same number of F-35s which the Queen Elizabeth class are designed to carry if they need at, at maximum. Four Gannett AEW aircraft. Anti-submarine has one. Two uh, Wessex has one for SARS and probably a Gannett COD or carry on board delivery aircraft. If we consider the modern air group of the Queen Elizabeth class, they're using helicopters for the COD role, they are using helicopters for the airborne early warning role, and of course the anti-submarine and the search and rescue role. And they're usually all Merlins. And the aviation facilities, as mentioned, two catapults, round four, two lifts, not three, and the hangar is roughly 200 meters by 24 meters or 4,800 meters squared. So please note it's 200 meters long by roughly 24 meters wide. Now, the hangar of HMS Queen Elizabeth is 155 meters long by 33.5 meters wide. 
So the Queen Elizabeth class, it's a wider hanger, but it's a shorter hanger. Again, it would be so good if they'd been an extra 30 meters longer. Even bigger hanger. Even bigger air group, potentially. Or better future proofing for the size of aircraft if they grow. With heights changing in the modern aircraft carrier from between 6.7 to 10 meters. Depending on where you are. Last maintenance. So, CV01. Simply put, it's a very conservative in terms of, I'm talking small c estimate on what they need. They've factored in some room for growth, they've factored in capabilities, but it's very, very much a stable. I would argue global power approach to naval aviation. They're not seeking to have the same as the Americans. They can't afford that. But they need to have a reliable capability. They need to have something they can guarantee we have available. When they have it available, they need to be useful. You have a sort of rough shape, rough dimensions. And the fact that those same that same shape dimensions roughly turns up when we're talking about a modern carrier design which is designed on much the same principles. Although sadly enough we have only got two of them because someone decided that they could guarantee available availability with two hulls. Very quickly this has been disproved. And very, very quickly. But still It's a good design. You can see the large radars and the communication systems it was going to be packing. You can see the facilities it has as a command structure. This is one of the earlier designs where they were actually moving the island slightly in towards the hull and creating an almost passageway around the outside of the island for aircraft to be moved around if they are brought up from the aft lift rather than disrupting aircraft landing or being directed that way. They could be in a raid nice and safely away from the flight line. If you're thinking that sounds interesting, you are right. But, again, whilst I have doubts that would have appeared in the final version of the design, in terms of the built version, It shows that even on a conservative level, they were still trying to think and innovate. Which is a good thing, and speaks good things for the quality of the ship that was likely to come about. Because if you don't care about what you're building, you just look at the benchmark navy and go, I want that. But at a price I can afford. I want that, but I want to pay this much for it. If you care about what you're building, you're going to put effort into considering options, into considering wider options. And this is where CV01 really comes in. There are a lot of wider options being considered, including this idea of being able to move aircraft up outside of the island. One of the problems I was looked into that was, of course, again, future-proofing aircraft, because it was okay. It would be okay with the generation of Phantoms and Buccaneers, but what about the aircraft which came after them? What about the aircraft which came after them? What would their differentials be? And that is a question. That is a problem for them to deal with. And it's one of the things which drives a lot of decision-making process in the CVO-1, but also in the Maltas. And I would hope you can say the same about the current Queen Elizabeth class. Because especially for a power which is going to be building less ships, 
and so might well not be constantly have a constant drum beat of construction to be able to adjust within but will have to build then how operate for many years and then build the next generation an aircraft carrier is probably going to see at least two potentially three generations of aircraft in their service time those carriers which served through World War II you can argue saw four generations of aircraft in real terms when you're talking about the sizes and the growth of the aircraft involved and that was a lot of the issues which built up throughout the war and people going oh smaller air groups well yeah that's because when these carriers were designed that was their, this was their air group and how much space was put in for growth of aircraft jet, air, jet engine aircraft come in there bigger multi engine aircraft come in there bigger aircraft which have bigger engines and carry bigger payloads they're usually bigger they'll take up more space so that's the interesting thing when you're looking at the CVA-1 because whilst it is being designed with very much a known air group in mind this is the air group which they're operating this is the air group which they understand the Phantom, the Buccaneer, the Gannet, the Sea King, the Wessex and by the way that is a Sea King lifting a Wessex I just I couldn't resist it was two birds one picture You have these aircraft which the Royal Navy really does understand. And yet they also know they have successes coming up. They are going to have to be replaced. The Royal Navy is going to have to get a new airborne early warning aircraft. They are going to have to get a replacement for the Wessex. It's probably going to be the Sea King, which is a much bigger helicopter when you see the Sea King and lifting the Wessex. This requires space. This requires thought, because otherwise your air group is going to shrink in size. So you have to design and think it the whole way through of going, how much space am I allocating to individual aircraft? How much space do I have for their stores? Which is another thing. If you're transitioning aircraft types, you might actually have to carry more uh, surge stores and have extra stores capability. Because you might be operating instead of you might not you might go to sea and instead of you operating 18 and 18 you might be operating 12 12 and 12 as you're transitioning in the new squadron or 9 9 and 18 so how much space do you have and these are things which smaller powers medium powers have to consider far more carefully than larger powers. How can I say that with confidence? Because consider the Royal Navy's approach to logistics in the 1900s and 1920s, etc., versus other nations' approach to logistics. Britain has bases everywhere. Their major point of logistics is moving supplies around between them. Yes, they have a replenishment sea capabilities, but that replenishment at sea usually just has to come from the nearest base, which will be a stockpile. So, yeah. you How many of those ships do you really need? You need fast ships, which can get you from that base to the fleet and catch up and resupply and go back. But if you're just keeping up a constant churn of supplies going around between your bases, you can afford to have most of your ships be slow ships wandering between bases, dropping off supplies. And they can be pretty much chartered civilian ships or pretty much civilian ships doing that job because they're not going to go anywhere near the action zone if you're thinking about launching your navy across an ocean though where you've got very limited supplies and your opponent might well be interdicting those supplies you're going to think more about rapid and fast oiling and supports that goes with you you have to A modern medium power is far closer to that scenario. So you have to think about these things when you're designing your carrier. And again, this is one of the interesting things when we're looking at the CVO one because of her shaping. Oh, wrong way. Right way. 
Actually, we go back to this one. The whole sh vessel, you can see, is designed with the idea of operating its fleet, but also sustaining its aircraft. It's a command ship. It's got plenty of space for command facilities. Even this picture, although it doesn't show it as well as the other picture, you can see the run around the island. Again, they can put aircraft in there. They can stock aircraft, store aircraft up there, out of the direction, out of the line of the flight line, out of sort of the effect of the aircraft landing and taking off. They can put them there. You can't launch them as quickly from behind there because you have to run around and angle them. And yes, they can be angled straight onto the forward forward catapult on terms of the starboard catapult. You can do that quite quickly, but you can't get them also you can't get them as easily to the waste catapult if there's a problem with that. In the end it is easier to have the island further out to starboard and have more just contiguous space in terms of flight deck but it was the idea and the same with the stores and the things they were fitting into them the idea was to have as much space for resilience of operations as possible and that brings us again to the modern Queen Elizabeth class Interestingly enough, of course, it's a return to the Malta idea of the uh, two island structure. It's always nice to go back. Again, they are built around being a multi-purpose tool, in that they are also a flagship command ship for not just the Royal Navy, but combined forces operations. They are capable of acting in those roles. They have huge lifts. Mounted starboard side, deck edge, and again we have a thing going on here. We have a ski ramp. Now there is a whole debate over catapults and fitting them to the Queen of the Class. Usually when we're doing that, we're talking about emails, and that is possible, required work, but we could do that. Electromagnetic accelerated launch systems, emails, or other assist electromagnetic assisted launch systems, depending on who you're talking to. But there is also an advantage to being a stovel carrier in terms of aircraft operations because you can literally just surge them off there is no resetting of a catapult there is no time needed for organizing that you just literally put the aircraft onto the runway portion and go take off okay it's not quite that simple but nothing ever is quite that simple and if I go through the full details I am definitely going over the 40 minute mark and I am striving to make sure I reach the 40 minute mark here and to keep within the 40 minute I'm not going to but yeah. but again what we are looking at when we look at these ships is a, our, is a carrier system designed for a medium power. They're not trying to ape the superpower because they don't have the same needs as the superpower. The superpower needs to send the ultimate, the benchmark, the image of superpower around the world. A medium power needs something that's going to show their power and capability but is also, they don't need it to be the supreme because they're not the supreme. 
they don't have to be the biggest and the best because they aren't. So they can get away with building what do we need to be able to do? What do we need to have as our capabilities? What will work best for us? And there are advantages. As I've talked about in other videos, I've said, you know, if Britain decided to replace Albion and Bulwark with LHDs, which I would love, basically based on the Trieste class, if I had my way. In an ideal world, if I had my way. I would probably replace it with three Triestes. Slightly larger versions of the Triestes. Because they're lovely LHDs. But all that would then give you five flight decks which could all operate the same air groups, the same aircraft. They can't operate the same size air group as one of these, but that gives you a capability in terms of interoperability if you have five flight decks which can do amphibious operations or carrier operations. Two which are carrier first, strike orientated flight decks, and three which are amphib orientated strike decks, uh, amphib orientated flight decks. And if necessary, the amphib can do the strike roll in a more limited way, and if necessary, the strike a carrier can do a strike flight deck can do the amphib roll in a more limited way. But that then gives you a pool of five ships to draw from. Which is almost as good as four ships of one class. Almost as good. Not quite, but almost. Ultimately, the story of British naval aviation post World War Two is of potential, of need, of value and utility, but of a constant misunderstanding and seeking of an excuse to avoid paying for it by governments that has undervalued it at several key points. We have two very good ships in the service now. We could have had four very good ships coming into service in the 1970s. Four very good ships which would probably be need to be replaced in the 2000s. Maybe they'd have gone on for 40 years and it would be in the 2010s. But the question you have to you have to ask yourself when you're talking about CVA one is not does the Falklands War happen if they're in service? That's not really a factor. The odds are no, it doesn't because that looks like a strong emphasis. This is one of the things again with the Terence. There is a whole pool of Terence which is you don't even realise it's working. Just because you look strong and you look like you care about the fence, that automatically sends the message. So you don't get in the situation in the first place because of how people approach you over subjects. Because you automat they automatically presume you're going to do something because you have the things to do it with. But today's question, therefore... comes from all of that. Today's question is what considerations do you think difference uh, differs again for medium powers versus superpowers in other areas of design? I've discussed today aircraft carriers but and I mentioned crew numbers but it's worthwhile thinking through for other uh, things because one of the constants you see in the media especially is our ship is not X which is what the benchmark fleet has so therefore it's not as good the question is never whether it's as good as that the question is is it as good uh, which is better for your needs this is better for Britain's needs CVA-1 would have been far better for Britain's needs than Kitty Hawk. As gorgeous, as amazing, and as capable as the Kitty Hawk class were. 
they would not have fitted Britain's needs as well as CVA-01. So, that's today's question. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you, uh, hope you had a good day. And um, take care. This is, I think, going out, let me just check, on the 6th. And if I'm not mistaken, the 6th is a Wednesday. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it interesting. It won't be a it won't have been a premiere or anything like that, but Wednesday videos for me sometimes do well, sometimes don't, but I like the midweek videos. Take care. Have a nice evening. What have we got coming up? Well, yesterday you should have seen the story of land ships. Next week we've got winning a war, holds off an unrestricted submarine warfare, and I haven't yet announced on Patreon when I'm recording this what the two videos will be for the uh, will be for the Thursday videos are coming up. So I'm therefore loathe to record put it in recorded yet because I might change my mind before it goes live on Patreon for the vote. Thank you very much. Take care and have a nice evening. Bye.